And now what I want to do is to move on to the audience interaction Q&A portion of our session. Stephen, would you please join us on the stage? Now, while the audience members are thinking about their questions or the kind of questions they would like to ask our speakers, let me then kick things off with a question of my own. So one of the key themes that kind of ran through both of your presentations is an idea of heterogeneity, right? There are lots of different types of sanctions and there are a lot of different types of strategic responses to them. I was wondering if the two of you could speculate a little bit as to why sometimes the responses of uh, uh, the responses to sanctions seem to be very effective at dampening their um, effectiveness and in other times less so. So if I may start actually, because I, uh, one comment I wanted to make about the capital outflows from Russia actually for the period, I uh, didn't show these results, but for the um, Crimea sanctions that we're looking at, actually there's also a bit of a rotation of who is actually present there, right? So in terms of the Western banks clearly are leaving, while um, Turkish, um, Indian, other, other banks are actually moving in and, 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 and sort of bringing in fresh, fresh finance. So to this extent, indeed, heterogeneity and these type of rotations are very important. And I, I presume uh, that similar issues are also at play in the uh, oil and gas market, uh, as you already and others have hinted at, that clearly some of the routing is now via um, countries there. Yeah. Yeah, so may, uh, maybe one quick note on, on, on the oil trade. I just want to make sure that everyone knows that the fact that India buys Russian oil is not sanctions evasion, just to be clear. As long as they stick to the $60 price cap, it's exactly what the sanctioning coalition wants to happen. They don't want to take the Russian oil off the market but they just want to limit how much Russia is getting paid for it. So we don't want the big disruption of the oil market, which is why it's actually okay for India to buy cheap Russian oil, but not expensive Russian oil. The other thing I think is that there's now, of course, a lot of focus on trade diversion. And, and you know, if you compare the charts of who's trading with whom, we see a lot of, of countries that are part of the sanctions coalition that by coincidence is now trading with Kazakhstan or Turkey or China at a completely different level than in the past. And of course, this is the next discussion we need to have in the sanctions coalition. How do we convince countries not to be part of circumventing sanctions through other countries, basically? All right, and now if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, yes, in the back. Thank you. <clears throat> First, um, it's really good to see the work that site is doing also with their partners in, in, in Ukraine in particular. Um, but as a, as a market pr practitioner, you always, or I always get the impression that sanctions underwhelm as opposed to overwhelm. Um, and, and you touched upon some of those, but one, in this case, it's clearly not a complete sanctions, right? Um, you just mentioned the oil market, and Europe is still importing gas, although much less, but still. And we have obviously China and, and a big part of the emerging markets that are not part of the sanctions. And then second, leakage, you also mentioned it, trade circumvention through the, through the stance and, and um, even from Europe, it seems to, to happen. And, and the third part, which I personally think is a big one, uh, is, is the timing. We, we're just not patient enough in evaluating things. Some of these things will take time to really have an effect on, on, on the Russian economy. But we're happy to, both on the financial part, but also perhaps on the, on the real economy from Torbjörn's side. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think just a quick note is that we introduced in the financial sector, of course, them very gradually. If we had sanctions and de swifted the whole Russian banking system from day one, I don't think they would have managed that, that challenge, if you want. So it's your, the Barba family kind of thing. We allow them the possibility to morph into different and change the balance sheets, et cetera, et cetera. So no. that would be my. 
I mean, for, for good and for worse, maybe a bad analogy. I mean, in, in military terms, they talk about this shock, shock and awe strategy. I think maybe also in the financial domain, um, that could have been a possibility in the sense of holding off, holding off until the very end. And then really, when it comes to um, something very serious like Ukraine invasion, then really mobilize everything one has rather than sort of piecemeal implement it and have all the agents uh, uh, give the capabilities to, to absorb and uh, adjust. But again, this is easily said. I think that obviously the po political configurations are such that this is maybe not possible in that domain. Yeah. Uh, Stephen, uh, I have, there was something I didn't understand in your analysis. At the beginning, you showed us that uh, corporate lending has declined as a result of the, uh, as the sanctions, and I thought maybe part of it is because of sanctions on companies, not on banks. But then you, sh you paired banks with companies, and you found that unsanctioned, in the case of unsanctioned banks and sanctioned companies, lending increased which is understandable because the company needs cash, but also investment increased. So this I don't understand. So, but, yeah. Why did investment by sanctioned companies increase and finance by borrowing from banks? I mean, I, I can only speculate. I mean, I, I would have to do more exercise on this to, to, to tease out the, the, the true answer, let's say. But I, I think one possibility could be that these, ba that these firms then benefited from the fact that they were actually dealing with unsanctioned banks and then vis-a-vis -vis their local competitors sort of. Uh... Yeah, but imagine that you have a sanctioned company. It needs cash because it cannot sell its goods, so it would borrow more. But why should it invest more if it is sanctioned and cannot expand? Because, I mean, maybe domestically it had like then a competitive advantage vis-a-vis -vis other companies that were dealing with sanctioned banks. And if there are difficulties in, in, in switching banks, which there are potentially some frictions there, then maybe at least in the short run, they, I mean, we, we assess this in one year, two year horizon, they have this possibility to say, okay, let's ramp up our investments here a little bit just to take advantage of this, of this opening. Um, yeah, but, but again, to, to tease that out, we would have to know exactly where they sell against who they are up. So I would be, this is a tentative answer. But this is a It would be interesting to break down the changes into those that resulting from sanctions on banks and those that result from bank, bank, uh, sanctions on companies. Uh, I agree with that, but clearly we, you know, these are sort of, these are parameters of uh, you know, expertise and also data collection, but I agree. So we, we, I, I write it down, see, let's, let's see what we can do. Can I add to that? Because it would also be interesting to see what sectors they would be involved in. Now, now we know what sector is a priority sector from a Russian perspective. So what are these firms are actually involved in? production of these kind of things. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, so uh, actually I was thinking of that result along the lines of the work that we made, <laughs> we uh, did uh, together lots of years ago, that it looks like that sanctions are harping especially politically connected banks and firms, and this is uh, giving a new lights an investment opportunity to unconnected uh, firms. So, so that was my interpretation of your finding. That, uh, but, but to tease that out, we would need the political connections yeah. of the firms as well. To, when, it could yeah. be both uh, through the credit market and uh, also through the competitive market and these two uh, yes, through the, uh, product yes. market, right? And these two effects uh, could reinforce each other. Thank you. Is in Russia, I wouldn't always bet on the market, though. I would bet on someone telling you what to invest in. But okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought I would go ahead and jump in here with a, another question of my own. So Stephen had mentioned how in the initial rounds of the financial sections against banks, the state was able to intervene with certain actions that very much mitigated the impact. But as we saw from Torbjorn's presentation later on, when it came to the restrictions on uh, oil exports, it seemed like the Russian state had much less of an answer. Could the two of you sort of speculate a little bit as to why there were such differences in response to these types of sanctions? I mean, my speculation would be that this first round of sanctions that we look at, given that we have the data, and this was mentioned that this is more difficult now, was much lighter. In the end, this sort of was a, a very light play. I think now it's much more serious, so maybe the government is, is more constrained in what we can do, but maybe I don't know what you want. Yeah, I mean, I think in, 
if we say now, now, it's really about how much money do they have and what do they prioritize. You know, of course, if the central bank can support the banking system and they, they are quite, you know, they know what to do, they have had crisis in the past. So, but the problem is that if you now start printing money because you run out of foreign exchange, you're going to have an inflation problem down the road. So I think now they have to be quite careful. And the other thing that they are also used to do is to put in, you know, just quantitative constraints. You cannot get foreign exchange for whatever you want, or you cannot get money out of Russia, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you know now the central bank is going to have to deal with I think a more complicated policy environment than was the case back then because the budget constraint is just much more severe now. Well, given that we're running a little bit short on time, I suggest we sort of end the session with some parting wisdom from our speakers. In particular, are there particular lessons that you hope policymakers would learn or could learn from the work that the two of you have done? Um, yeah, maybe I reiterate a little bit what I said before in terms of financial sanctions. Clearly, I think you want to roll them out quickly in big, big ticket um, rather than sort of piecemeal. I, I think that that's good for your own feeling and maybe plays well politically, but I think in the end doesn't affect them much. Um, so sort of a combination of uh, SWIFT uh, and all sorts of debt asset sanctions. And then also, you, you also I think have to be realistic in, in your ability to um, enforce and assess what, what, what your own banks and, and, and other banks in the world other than Russian banks are doing. And I think you cannot underestimate how difficult this is. I think that that, that would be my policy takeaway. Well, I mean, my, my first takeaway is, is like I talked about here, limiting the amount of money that Russia is getting paid for its oil. It's really driving the economy, it's financing the budget, it's creating the opportunities to buy stuff from different parts of the world to, to sort of feed the war machine. And the other part is basically talk to other countries that are involved in sending the microchips and other components to, to building, you know, missiles and stuff that they use in Ukraine. So that would be the two things. All right, please join me in another round of applause for our various speakers.